instrument? Oh, I play drums, bass, guitar, piano, synthesizers, everything. And you play behind many, many crew groups? Yes, yes. I play with uh, Pumpkin All-Stars we have. We did uh, King of the Beat, that's by Pumpkin. Rockin' It, Rockin' It by the Phyllis Four. Heartbeat by the Treacherous Three. Uh, problems of the World Today by the Phyllis Four. Many, many. <laughs> this is Jay Kwan and this is Foundation Lesson 2.0. Pumpkin, the original King of the Beats. Now originally this was just Foundation Lesson number two, but I have uh, spiced it up kind of remixed it so to speak got some better images a little bit of video footage and things of that nature a little bit longer and a little more in-depth so here we go Earl Bedward better known as Pumpkin came from a musical family he played several instruments but the one that he gravitated towards the most was the drum now Pumpkin was fluent in Spanish as his father's side of the family was Costa Rican and Panamanian in the early 70s, before hip-hop records were even a thing, Pumpkin could be found in his garage practicing on his drums. There was a church directly across the street from his house, and even the church had gotten used to hearing Pumpkin practicing on his drums all times of the day and night. Now, Cool Cow the Star Child, the first solo rap artist signed to Enjoy Records, one of the early MCs from that first era, of uh, recorded MCs who rhymed before records and actually a legendary graffiti artist from back in the days was one of Pumpkin's best friends growing up. Now Cal tells me that in a two or three block radius of where they grew up in the Bronx there were several musicians and vocalists who would go on to do big and great things later on. Amongst them Steve Jordan, the drummer from The Letterman Show, Christopher Williams, the vocalist, Vincent Davis of Entertainment Records, who signed Keith Sweat and Dougie Fresh, uh, Joe Ski Love, and several other artists back in the days. Radio personality and DJ and recording artist Chuck Chillout. Now, Kyle played Little League with Steve Jordan, and they had to walk past Pumpkin's house to get to their practice. So, the way that Kyle actually even met Pumpkin was passing his house and hearing him play on the drums practicing in his garage as he always did and as Cal approached Pumpkin he told him look you know I'm interested in drums too I'm about to get a drum set I like to practice with you and that came to fruition Cal's parents got him his drum set they practiced together they became friends and a little known fact about Pumpkin that Cal actually dropped on me was that he was like the neighborhood like hair braider you know back in the days if you had an afro and you wanted to braid it up you go to Pumpkin to get your hair braided. And the way that Cal found that out was he was asking around, hey, you know, I, I need to get my fro braided up. Where can I go? And they say, you know, go to that cat Pumpkin that, that plays the drums. And Cal said he was kind of blown away by that because you just didn't find that back in the days, you know, guys who could actually, you know, braid hair. But that's that's one of Pumpkin's many talents from back then. The fact that he was, he was the neighborhood uh, braid guy at the time. So not only were Cal and Pumpkin, good friends, they would actually become artists together on Enjoy Records. And the way that this happened was, as Pumpkin was practicing in his garage, he would draw crowds of people just gathering around to see what he was doing, because everybody, again, could hear could hear this, you know, for a good distance away. And one of the, in the groups of people, some of the members of these groups of people that gathered around to hear his music, were members of the Funky 4 Plus 1. They befriended Pumpkin, and they introduced him to Bobby Robinson of Enjoy Records. Now, Bobby Robinson, responsible for early successes by Gladys Knight and the Pips, uh, Frankie Lyman, so many doo-wop groups. He, he had uh, Enjoy Records, Fire and Fury Records, quite a few record stores. Uh, Bobby's Happy House record store in Harlem, but he had those labels as well. So he's, a, he's an entrepreneur back then. So, just as Sylvia Robinson, no relation to him, across the water in Jersey in the late 70s got an interest in recording rap music, so did Bobby Robinson. And he was hearing so many cars pass by playing his music, you know, his tapes uh, from the legendary clubs of the day that I always talk about, the T-Connections and the Fevers and those kind of clubs, the whole Avenue Boys Club. Harlem World and Burger King Disco and all the places where they they actually recorded this music 
um, cars would ride by with tapes of this. So Bobby was hearing this music everywhere. His son actually was an MC, so he was hearing it from his son. His son was one of the Disco Four. And then he was hearing it from his nephew, Spoonie G. So he was kind of inundated with this with this new talking music that all the young kids were playing. And just like Sylvia Robinson, he said, hey, maybe I can capitalize off this and do something with it. So he converted in Joy Records, which again, dealt with soul, R&B, doo-wop long before you know rap records existed. He converted that into a rap label. And the first group on that label was the Funky 4 Plus 1. And the Funky 4 Plus 1 invited Bobby Robinson to Pumpkin's Garage to hear him actually play. And he actually came there and, and, and saw him perform. And he, on the spot, hired him to be the session drummer behind probably 90% of the Enjoy Records rap records. Probably more than that. On most of those Enjoy rap records, you would see produced and arranged by Pumpkin and Friends. Now, the Friends were musician friends of pumpkins that he would invite to these sessions to help him arrange the music and play the music so you would see production credits of sometimes bobby robinson and pumpkin or sometimes bobby robinson pumpkin and friends or just pumpkin and friends but on a majority of those records that's what you saw and one of the major differences between enjoy records and sugar hill records i always say that to me uh sound wise even just the way they went about things but especially sound wise Sonically, I would say that Sugar Hill was like Motown and Enjoy was like Stax, really, to me. And I think a lot of people who know about those labels and their output, they share that sentiment. Now, Sylvia in the late 70s was signing like the Sugar Hill Gang from Jersey, Sequence from uh, South Carolina, and those kind of rap groups. You know, Sylvia, she kind of stumbled on a rap. You know, one night she was in, I believe it was Harlem World. And she was at her niece's birthday party at that club. And she saw Love Bug Starsky on the wheels of steel and rhyming simultaneously. And she said, okay, you know, I need to get into this. This can go somewhere. This this can, can make a profit for me. And so that was her way in. Uh, the Sugar Hill Gang sequence, her first rap groups. Now, Bobby was signing the groups who had already kind of uh, were from the New York area at least the Tri-Cities, or it's Tri-State area, I'm sorry. And groups like Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, Funky Four Plus One, um, The Treacherous Three, Master Don Committee, Cool Cow, The Star Child, that was like his roster of artists. So by one point, Sylvia being the shrewd businesswoman that she was, she first of all, she was able to get her records on the radio and get them promoted a lot better and faster than Bobby Robinson. You gotta remember, Sylvia Robinson was a singer, a legendary singer in her own right. She ran her own stable of labels as well, but her labels were a lot more successful than Bobby Robinson's. You know, she had Stang Records, Turbo Records, All Platinum, you know, several, several labels. You know, she dealt with the Moments and the Whatnots, the Rim Shots. You know, Moments actually later became Ray Goodman and Brown. But again, you know, she had Love is Strange with her and Mickey long before any of this so sylvia was well established and she had a kind of circuit of radio disc jockeys and distributors that she already dealt with so she was able to get rappers delight on the radio and all the early furious five stuff where bobby was a lot more underground and had a lot more difficulty getting those artists off the ground so at some point it's reported that she offered bobby robinson ten thousand dollars for the contracts of Spoonie G, who again was the nephew of Bobby that he had signed. Um, Spoonie had made records on Peter Brown's label, Sound of New York, but also, you know, he had made the love rap and, you know, uh, records with Bobby Robinson. So Sylvia bought the contract of, again, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, Funky Four, Spoonie G, and eventually the Treacherous Three. So at, at one point, you know, by, by 80, 81, most of the authentic rap that was already out, she had them all in her stable. And she started to put out these compilations, the great rap hits. And you would see records by Spoonie G, records by Lady B, and artists that originally weren't signed to her label. But again, she was a shrewd businesswoman and she saw the rap could do something, so she, she got them all. But back to Pumpkin. 
you know, I call Pumpkin uh, one of the original super producers in the genre because what Pumpkin was doing was he was one of the first to go around, if not the first to go around and, and get money from different labels for his productions. Um, you know, he wasn't just an in-house person or a person who, you know, just contributed to a couple of records. He was in Joy's uh, main producer and drummer. And again, that's on the strength of the Funky 4 Plus 1 introducing him to Bobby Robinson and Bobby coming out and hearing him play in his garage. But like the first rap record on Enjoy was Rapping and Rocking the House by the Funky 4 Plus 1, 1979. Pumpkin played on that. And then if you look, by 1980, he's on Pep Records doing Million Dollar Legs by the Outlaw 4. And then he's back over at uh, Enjoy Records. Then he bounces over to Profile Records. And while he's at Profile Records, he's recording for Tough City Records under different uh, pseudonyms and aliases. And I'll get a little more detail into that uh, coming up soon. So Pumpkin was, was again, um, one of the first people to be considered a producer in, in this music that was running around and, and getting money and, and contracts from different labels for his productions. <laughs> So again, now it's 1979, rapping and rocking the house, Funky 4 Plus 1, one of the first, or the first rap record on Enjoy Records. Um, rapping and rocking the house, musically based on To Be Real by Sheryl Lynn, just slow down a little bit. Um, you know, 79, when we talk about the first rap records, we always talk about King Tim III and Rapper Delight. That's the default in these conversations. But 79 gave us quite a few rap records, and that was one of them. Uh, Super Rapping by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five was 79 on the same label, Enjoy Records. Now, Pumpkin didn't play on that. But 79 gave us a, a slew of rap records, actually. And it's funny because, you know, Rapper's Delight didn't drop until middle of September. So that only gave you uh, three or four months in 79 to make rap records. So if we are going with the, the accepted history that King Tim III and Rappers Delight were first, that means everything else would have had to come after. So you're talking about spooning rap, you're talking about rapping and rocking the house, you're talking about super rapping, you're talking about uh, uh, Paul Winley's daughters, uh, Sweet T and I forgot her sister. They had a record on, um, on, on Winley Records. There are a great many records that dropped in 79. So what, what that, that begs the question is, but what it shows us is that Everybody kind of jumped on this idea right around the same time. They had been hearing, you know, rap in the city. You know, they had been hearing tapes or whatever. You know, when I talked to cats like Doug Wimbish and other guys who ended up working for Sugar Hill, you know, as part of the house band and, and some of Sylvia's bands before rap, they tell me that, oh, yeah, we had heard rap, you know, in, in cars passing by and kids with boom boxes, you know, they would play the live tapes and stuff. So everybody was hopping on this idea at the same time. So without question, there's enough information out there that suggests that if Sylvia Robinson had not made Rappers Delight in 79 or been responsible for putting that together, rap would have come either way because, you know, King Tim III was on the way. But we would have had Spoonie G and Paul Winley's Daughters and everybody else who made records in 79. And like I said, it's, it's quite a few. Uh, th there might have been a dozen 
rap records in 79 mostly way under the radar obviously um independent labels that were much smaller than sugar hill and even enjoy and they just didn't have the muscle to get their stuff out there now i always say that the planets come together the way they come together for a reason and i'm never one that say to take anything away from sugar hill to say oh if they hadn't done it somebody else would have done it i mean clearly somebody else would have done it but the whole history of this thing would have been altered because these other uh these other labels did not have the power that Sugar Hill had and they did not have the right product whether you think that it was better than Rapper's Delight or not it was not uh Rapper's Delight was the record that did what it was supposed to do to get this this music on the map now how you feel about that is how you feel about it but uh, no other record could have done it no other record did do it so kind of got off subject for a second but uh, that's a very interesting conversation that I will be exploring a lot more soon uh, is the amount of records that came out in 79 and just after September of 79 it's a kind of mind-blowing amount of records now I previously mentioned that the breakbeat that Pumpkin used to like to emulate was Squib Cakes by Tower Power you know Tower Power is a great band great horn section um, just an overall great great band grew up on that band myself um, Squib Cakes was not a popular break you know in the streets it's not one you're going to hear on tapes or whatever but it was something that pumpkin as a drummer and a musician he heard it and he uh he was taken by it and he incorporated it into a lot of his productions especially his productions on enjoy records but he also uh, he also played a variation of it on million dollar legs by the outlaw four and that was 1980 and this was one of the first times or the first time you heard pumpkin called out on record you know um his name was on production credits you know you would see pumpkin you would see pumpkin and friends pumpkin and friends was basically he had a group of friends who were musicians that he would bring in to help him arrange their records on enjoy records so you would see production credits by pumpkin and friends but outside of that you wouldn't have known anything about pumpkin like you wouldn't about most producers and music unless you read the 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 credits but on Million Dollar Legs, his name was actually called out. Yeah, Million Dollar Legs, highly, highly sought after record. If you got an original pressing of that, you, you're sitting on a very expensive record. But uh, so, yeah, you can hear that he's playing a variation of Squib Cakes by Tower Power on Million Dollar Legs. And what was coming up around the corner with Pumpkin and Treacherous 3 and a string of their records was what would become rap records that became breakbeats in themselves. And what I'm saying is there's a string of records by the Treacherous Three, uh, At The Party, Body Rock, Heartbeat, New Rap Language, and The Love Rap, especially. Those, those records, uh, Body Rock to a lesser degree, there were parts of those records, breakdowns, intros, and drum parts that, you know, the DJ saw, okay, this is a breakbeat. And 
these became the backbone of a lot of the live old school performances. So for those who have access to, you know, Cold Crush and Crash Crew and Furious Five and Force MCs and any of the live tapes from from that era, especially any tapes recorded, you know, between 80 and probably 83, you're going to hear uh, especially love rap in the background. You hear a lot of uh, the breakdown, the heartbeat, and that's one that... Um, Charlie Chase used to love to spin that one. He used to do really good work with that one. But the way you'll know that it's love rap is, you know, you'll hear the DJ backing up two two copies, backspinning two copies of a drum break, and then you you know if they don't catch it in time, you'll hear from the south to the west to the east to the north. Come on, Spoonie G, go off, go off, and that's the treacherous three with uh, Spoonie G on love rap. And um, if you look at my treacherous three lesson, you will see that. L.A. Sunshine, a member of the Treacherous Three, told me that he was in Joy's Warehouse and he saw um, the paperwork for platinum plaques uh, or platinum certification for Love Rap and uh, New Rap Language, which was all on the same 12 inch. You know, one was the A side, one was the B side. So what I'm saying is, of course, it was just a popular record underground, but popular enough at the time where a lot of people bought it. But many DJs. Were, were buying at least two copies And when they were out there too They'd go get two more Because this became a breakbeat And not many rap records Became a breakbeat The only one I, other one I could think of Right off hand Was perhaps uh, T-Ski Valley Catch the Beat And maybe Is Your Rock by Fantasy 3 You know there was a piece Of one of Cool Cow's records uh, Rockin' Time uh, That was used In a routine by the Cold Crush But it wasn't the breakbeat part So it, it was it was not very popular for a rap record to become a breakbeat in itself. And uh, the Treacherous Three scored a couple of them. Special K. Sunshine. Kumo D. And we're the Treacherous, the Treacherous, the Treacherous Three. Gonna rock from the bottom to the T.O.P. One MC's of the year. You say we tried, tried, tried. Well, now we did it, now we're done. We proved it to the people that we are number one. Now we're back, now we're back, now we're back for more. Hot to give the party people what we have in store. So let's play the game, let's play the game. Oh, let's rock, rock, the rock, and keep it the same. It's like a lunch, 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 crunch. And this is the way we're rocking a bunch. If we ain't all well, the captain ain't crunch. Muhammad Ali never do a punch. The ladies never came up in a bunch. And at 12 o'clock, you know you don't eat lunch. It's like a wag, pack, double back, hot. Because it possibly tells us what do we lack Say no you can't because a matter of fact Because we're right on top and we're so exact It's like together, forever, together, forever And this is the way we rock all together Do it Of us. So let us tell you the deal because it is a must. Well, I'm the number uh, one ace. Uh, I'm the face in the face. I'm the face uh, in the place. Uh, when I said the uh, pain, and I'm the number one dude. Uh, so uh, loose uh, with the youth, and I got more rhymes than that mother goose. Well, I'm the number one trade here to stay. Yes, to say that when I play all the way until the break of day. And party people, number four, back and more on the floor. Go on and party, 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 till you can't more. And the man, number five, makes the crowd come alive. Reggie Ranch on the mix, and it takes no job. But there's no man, number six. To the west, to the east, to the north Come on, Spoonie G 
Uh, yes, yes, y'all. A free freak, y'all. Uh, to the beat, y'all. It's so unique, y'all. Well, I was speeding down the street, then I pushed my brake because I seen a fine girl, made me shiver and shake. Then I blew my horn and she turned her head. And to the younger lady, this is what I said. I said, baby, baby, come on over to my car and tell me your name so I can know who you are and just give me your number, address, and all. I might want to see you, I might want to call. Your friend sounds your house wherever you be, but meanwhile, baby doll, just come with me. So I opened my door, she got into my car. She looked into my face, said, I know who you are. She said, I seen you once, I can't forget your face. You got style, got class, from the same taste. I said, I'm glad you think so, I'm glad we met. Cause I haven't met a girl, nothing like you yet. But just lay on back and relax your head, because my seats are soft, just like a bed. And then she looked at me and started to smile. She said, baby, let's have a little fun for a while. I know every move from A to Z, but if it's alright with you, it's alright with me. But if we do it in the car, that's no respect. So let's go to my house. She said, it's a bed. And when I got into my house, I drove the female wow. The first thing she said is, let's have a child. I said, no, no, baby, I only got time to make a lot of money and to save my heart. And if I had a baby, I might go broke. And believe me, to me, girl, that ain't no joke. People smile in your face and talk behind your back. And when you get the story, it's never exact. Some say they're your friends, but they really are not. Because they're only out to try to get what you got. They want to hang out a day, smoke, cheap, or sniff coke. Then to see your lady alligator when you broke. But you attract all the dudes and all the younger ladies. With your diamond rings and your big Mercedes. Go on your chest with your fine suit and clothes. Because that's the way the whole story goes. Now you got you a girl and you're doing the do. But every girl you see, you think she's made for you. She used to walk down the street and never did speak. Now she knows you got money at the tip of your feet. And you're a sucker, sucker dude for thinking you're slick. Because all you're going to do with the girl is trick. You can't lead yourself because you've been led. The same young girl that messed up your head. Every time you look around, he's asking for your money. She thinks it's cool. She thinks it's funny. <laughs>
So yeah, from 1980, most of those records were 80, but in 80, 81, I mean, Treacherous 3 just hit you with a string of singles. You know, every time you turned around, it was a new single dropping by the Treacherous and uh, Pumpkin on production on those. You know, at the party, the first one that I played, the uh, little rhythm line was a variation on um, Seventh Wonder, uh, Daisy Lady, popular breakbeat. Sugar Hill Gang used it for Eighth Wonder. They had a huge hit with it. But uh, to avoid any kind of copyright infringement, uh, the Treacherous Three, when they had their uh, uh, musicians play it, they played a little a variation of it. So it's not exactly the same uh, same rhythm line, but it's it's the same thing. And um, so that was a that was a hot record. A lot of good breakdown parts in there. A lot of good drums by Pumpkin. You heard that you know used as a breakbeat. Not as much as some of the other ones like Heartbeat and New Rap Language, but you heard it. Body Rock was. Uh, I always say that that was you know the first time that rap and rock were fused on a on a record um it was not rock box by run dmc it you know rock box by run dmc got the mtv play and it got the exposure uh, but the treacherous three a couple years beforehand uh you know three three years beforehand four years beforehand had merged rock and rap on the body rock and of course that's been sampled by mariah carey and some of everybody and uh, a dope record, definitely different for the time. And Sunshine said on that one, you know, the guitar player just started to go somewhere, you know, somewhere else with the guitar, and he just let him go where he wanted to go, and that's that's what came out was basically a rock record. Uh, the new rap language and love rap. Now that's you know, Spoonie G, an original member of the Treacherous Three, and if you go back to my Treacherous Three and Spoonie G lessons, you'll see exactly what happened and why it transpired that he ended up ultimately not being in the group but he was originally a member of the group um once he went solo he he reunited with them on love rap and new rap language you know, love rap that side was just him just him rhyming but that drum pattern and again based on another one based on squib cakes um it became a breakbeat and like i discussed previously if you hear any of those old school tapes you'll hear the treacherous three in the background you know, whenever the DJ, you know, didn't catch the record in time enough to, uh, you know, to, to miss that vocal part coming in. Um, flip side of that was New Rap Language, which wasn't used as a breakbeat as much, but of course, a monumental record in its own right with the fast rap, the birth of the fast rap. And again, you can go to my Kumo D lesson on foundationhiphop.com, ask my Kumo D interview on foundationhiphop.com. Or you can go and check out the, the Treacherous 3 lesson, the Spoonie G lesson, to get more information on that particular record. But Spoonie G's uh, cousin, Poochie Costello, on congas on that particular recording and did an uh, excellent job and actually was credited there. I, he's on other records too, but I don't usually see him credited on those. But a distinctive uh, conga sound and percussion sound on all those records. And... Um, those records, they feel good, man. They bring back uh, some of the best times, man. Those were good summers, you know, back in 80, 81. Um, listening to those records, just the party atmosphere. You know, that's one thing that Sylvia made very popular was what they called a clap track, where she left a track open and just let a crowd of people that they invited in to recreate a party atmosphere. She just let that go. And, you know, you hear the party people in the background. And that's something, and Joy used that very heavily as well. And when you combine that with the drum sounds and the congas and the other instruments and just everything from that time, those were magical records for those of us who were there and remember. Those those records mean everything. Those were magical records. And of course, Heartbeat, again, a, another element to the magic of those records is a lot of them were based on records that were already hot, you know. Um, and I always say summer records. They weren't all summer records, but some of my greatest summer memories were like, you know, the summer that heartbeat drop and maybe heartbeat didn't drop in the summer but back then when a record was hot it, it could be hot for an entire calendar year and then of course in the summer was the time you enjoyed the records the most you know the pool parties and everything else but uh yeah i, I call those uh, like the summer anthems you know again pull up to my bumper and heartbeat and, you know all the different records that as soon as those records became popular our rap version came out and so it was with Heartbeat. And some other people attempted to do Heartbeat. Sweet G from The Fever um, and Fever Records, West End Records, he did a version. Um, had nowhere near the magic that, uh, 
that the Treacherous Threes version had. Their version was just, uh, it, it was like I said, it was put together perfectly from the intro when they do the huh, ha, you know, with the horns behind it. You know, everything was uh, was just right as far as that goes. Now, I mentioned Cool Cow, the star child earlier. Again, the first solo uh, rap artist signed to Enjoy Records. The first and probably only artist that had an actual picture cover for his 12-inch single on Enjoy. And his for his second single, is Rockin' Time, Greg G from the Disco 4, his label mate, suggested to him that they use a break beat for that record called Is It In by Jimmy Bo Horn because the Disco 4 was about to jump ship and go to Profile Records. Now, even though one of Bobby Robinson's sons was a member of Disco 4, they were about to leave Bobby's label, Enjoy, and go to Profile with uh, Corey Robbins and Steve Plotnicki. So he suggested to Cal, why don't you use this break beat? And Cal said, okay, cool. And he also incorporated the bass line from Pull Up To My Bumper by Grace Jones. Went to Bobby to get the okay. You know, hey, look, it's time for me to do my second single. And Bobby agreed. And Bobby said, look, you know, the, the new drummer we got. Um, and he wasn't exactly new at that point. But, you know, since Cal's first record that Pumpkin wasn't on, you know, um, Pumpkin came into the fold. And he said, hey, why don't you use the drummer um, Pumpkin for your record? Which was perfect because, as I stated earlier, Kyle already had a friendship with Pumpkin. That was his hair braider and his friend, you know, from his teenage years that he played drums with. So you got his rocking time. And his rocking time was one of the only other times outside of Million Dollar Leg that somebody actually called Pumpkin out, you know, on the actual beats. Now, this is during the Enjoy era. Later on, he definitely will be called out several times. But to be called out by name, this was like the second time that it had been done and really the only time in the Enjoy era that it had been done was on his rocking time. To prove that not only the hand is quicker than the eye, but that the mouth is quicker than the ear. Say hocus pocus and we will appear. One, two, three, four, kids without fear. It's a not of illusions, just to stay it clear from all the wizard and lie from front to rear. It's magic that will make our talents rise. It's magic, but not apparent to eyes. It's, it's magic, magic, not known to any other MC. It's magic, of course, what else could it be? The statements we make may be conceited and grim But what is normal to us is an illusion to them It's magic You got the devastating Tito, that's me And I won't even give a clue of my ability Don't think that I really have nothing to say Cause I'm so good you have to see it to believe it anyway You got the mighty might see Most definitely I'm somewhat of a brother of this time You see, you know that I'm number one And I'm not saying nothing funny And I'll give a hoot daddy a run for his money And there's the great peso you all should know I make girls levitate Make a black wall glow To a light that's right Putting plays in flight And that's just a little sample of all my might Say more than bubble Call it trouble and that's the cause 
Yes, sir, you have. The greatest microphone wizard of all LMCs. For all the nervous, so with that, I'm through. From now on, I will be known as MWU. DLB, the microphone wizard, y'all. He's DLB, the spell to start the ball. Shazam! Nicky D. All the girls. <laughs> well, I could rock a rhyme from the town nine to six. You know that I could do the same if only I had the mix. Yeah, but I could wave my hand and part the seek. <laughs> So the Fearless Four only did two records on Joy, but you know both both produced by Pumpkin, drums by Pumpkin, and you can hear that signature Enjoy sound. Disco Four, most of their records on Enjoy were definitely produced by Pumpkin, Pumpkin on the drums. If you go back and check my Disco Four lesson, you can kind of get a little more in-depth idea of exactly what Pumpkin did on which records. Now, I mentioned earlier that right around 82 or so, Disco Forward jump and ship and go on the profile. And it's interesting because the Master Don Committee ended up going to profile as well. And of course, Pebbly Poo was part of the Master Don Committee. And that's why you got like Fly Guy by, by Pebbly Poo came out on profile because the whole Master Don Committee was over there. And that was when, you know, Pebbly Poo did the answer to Fly Girl by the Boogie Boys. Um, and then Pumpkin ended up on profile as well. But it's interesting because while Pumpkin was on profile, he was also making records for Tough City. But he was making these profile records under contract. Like I said, they supposedly paid him $10,000 or somewhere in that neighborhood to come over and produce exclusively for profile records. But he was actually <laughs> moonlighting, so to speak, with uh, Aaron Fuchs over at Tough City. And this is, of course, unbeknownst to... Uh, Corey Robbins and Steve Plotnicki over at Profile and he was recording under the name uh, Jack O'Lantern or Oliver Shalom just different pseudonyms um, or aliases over there also you know his name again was Earl Bedward where he would produce under Burl Edward which I'm kind of surprised that Profile didn't didn't catch that but maybe they weren't even looking maybe the Tough City stuff was flying so low under the radar but like records by Puffy D and records by um, Grandmaster Cass, some of his solo stuff, um, MC New York. Um, you know, a lot of those records were actually Pumpkin under different names. He also 
would record under the name The Smoking Commission because Smoking was a subsidiary label of Tough City and you would see uh, produced by The Smoking Committee and that was basically Pumpkin in his mother's basement with a, a Lindrum, a DX7 keyboard and an emulator. That was his setup and that was his go-to drum machine from what I've heard is, is the Lindrum. So the move to profile for all those artists but particularly for Pumpkin is one that kind of runs parallel with how the technology was going. So all those Enjoy records, those weren't drum machines. Those, even though you had drum boxes out at the time, you know, uh, Master Don had what he called a funk box, and then, you know, Flash had his mainly operated drum machine that he called a beat box, and the Force MCs had a drum machine. But the modern drum machines were just becoming affordable, you know, for for kids in in, in these neighborhoods to get them, and that's what they basically were. These were still kids, but in you know, basically. So uh, the technology move and everything was right on time with the label move. So the profile stuff is not really a lot of drums going on in those records. When Pumpkin goes to profile, these are mostly drum machine bass records. And Pumpkin was very prolific on that drum machine. And they say that anything he could play on the drums, he could emulate it very, very um, precisely on the drum machine. But the profile records, those were a a next school of hip hop, and um, Pumpkin was right there for it. You know, right around '83, you started seeing him produce a lot of stuff for like Jacqueline Hyde, Disco Four. Some of their best joints were produced by Pumpkin. He did an All Star record on Profile, which I'll get into, and he did records under his own name. Um, he did Mastodon co Committee records um, at Profile, but these were all, like I said, technologically, you could just hear the advancement um, in the sound because these were drum machines and a little less instruments. That stripped down sound that, you know, I always give Run DMC credit for with Sucker MCs. It was in full swing and um, Pumpkin was right there for it.
track is with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And we're cut up all the wings of love and our style of rap fits like a glove. Yeah, definitely a uh, a strong string of classics on Profile. And he did other stuff on Profile as well. Like I said, you can YouTube some of the stuff with Mastodon Committee that he did. But uh, you know, Getting Money, a very good Jekyll and Hyde record. You know, one of their better ones outside of AMPM, my favorite. Um, you check out the instrumental version. Again, with these records, the instrumental versions and dub versions, a lot of times... It wasn't like they just took the vocal track out and let it run. A lot of times the way it was edited, it was a whole different version unto itself. So uh, the instrumental version of Getting Money will really give you a great appreciation for what Pumpkin did on those uh, those drum machines. Uh, incredible work. Incredible drum programming. Um, Disco 4. My two favorite songs by them, We're at the Party, which Pumpkin didn't produce. But School Beats, like their best work. Definitely their, their best work that was on the same 12 inch with uh with Throw Down, which was produced by Pumpkin as well. It's a dope song, but School Beats is it. You know, the way he did the, the drum beat, it's an unorthodox pattern. He throws the hand clap in at like a really odd time. You know, it's not off beat, but it's just an odd way that he programmed it. And it gave it a certain flavor. And you go back and check my disco four lesson, and you'll, you know, you'll get a little more background on school beats in that 12 inch. Then, of course, uh, King of the Beat, his 12-inch record, you know, um, which was a dope record. Kind of like his version of, like, you know, Davy DMX doing one for the treble. You know, this is King of the Beat, uh, a title that, you know, Mantronics would claim or Mantronic would claim. And many producers in the, you know, in the in the realm of hip-hop would either proclaim themselves King of the Beat or their fans um, and the people would proclaim them King of the Beat. But Pumpkin definitely one of the early kings of the beat and you know proclaiming in itself on that on that 83 single on profile and then of course here comes that beat you know one of the first posse records you know you had Jekyll and Hyde on there Fresh 3 MCs Disco 4 you know some of the more prominent people on profile label at that time you know of course Run DMC was missing on it I always wonder like what kind of record would that have been if Run DMC had been on uh, on Here Comes That Beat of course they were so busy at that time this was 84 and their full length album had just dropped and you know sucker mcs jam master j hard times just like that you know fresh fest is going on i'm sure they just didn't have time to uh, to deal with that record but that would have been great that was a special record um one of, one of the better records of 84 that was a uh, you know the singing on it the um the scratching scratch on galaxy with that very unique brand of scratching that he he did on a few records. Um, sonically, that was something different and uh, still a classic. You know, people still talk about that record to this day. Hey, young ladies, first we would start with breaking your heart with some acapella rock and roll, taking control of your body and your soul. So don't you want to go to the disco? Disco, disco, disco. Yes, indeed. Pumpkin is the prototype for the modern day producer. Again, Pumpkin, much like the producers and beat makers of today, was going around to different record labels and selling beats to them early and signing as exclusive producer 
in the very infantile stages of the rap industry. It really wasn't a real rap industry yet when Pumpkin had established um, this pattern of, of producing and the way that, you know, the way that he fed his family and, and made his money. So definitely deserving of the title King of the Beat, Pumpkin succumbed to complications from pneumonia in the early 90s before he even reached 30 years old. But he leaves behind a canon of classics that are still enjoyed, mimicked, and imitated today. And this is Jay Quan again, Pumpkin Lesson 2.0, King of the Beats. You can reach me on all social media at Jaquan VA. That's J A Y Q U A N V A. If you'd like to donate to the foundation, you can do so. Patreon.com slash Jaquan for an ongoing donation. Jaquan Music VA at gmail.com for PayPal or dollar sign Jaquan One for Cash App. That's the dollar sign and J A Y Q U A N O N E on Cash App. Peace and respect.